Okay, so today is the uh, 19th of August. Yesterday I was thinking of uh, going to the last sutta of uh, the Mughalana Sangyutta, but uh, today I decided not to uh, because uh, there's not much Dhamma there, it's just about how Venerable Mahamughalana often goes up to the heavens uh, and talks to the devas. Uh, and so now I start on chapter 41, Chitta Sangyutta. This course is connected with Chitta, the Anagamin layman uh, during the Buddha's time. Uh, and these suttas are very inspiring. Uh, so I will read every sutta here uh, in this Sangyutta. 41.1. On one occasion, a number of elder monks were dwelling at Machi Kasanda in the wild mango grove. And on that occasion, and the elder monks have returned from their arms round. After their meal, they assembled in the pavilion and were sitting together when this conversation arose. Friends, the factor and the things that factor, are these things different in meaning and also different in phrasing? Or are they one in meaning and different only in phrasing? Some elder monks answered thus, Friends, the factor and the things that factor, are different in meaning and also different in phrasing. But some other elder monks answered thus, Friends, the factor and the things that factor are one in meaning and different only in phrasing. Now on that occasion, Chitta, the householder, had arrived in Miga Pataka on some business. Then Chitta, the householder, heard a number of elder monks, they said, on returning from their arms round, had assembled in the pavilion after the meal and were sitting together when this conversation arose. Friends, the factor and the things that factor, are these things different in meaning and also different in phrasing, or are they one in meaning and different only in phrasing? The Chitta, the householder, approached those elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side and said to them, I have heard, Venerable Sirs, that when a number of elder monks were sitting together, this conversation arose. Friends, the factor and the things that factor, are these things different in meaning and also different in phrasing? Or are they one in meaning and different only in phrasing? That is so, householder. Venerable Sirs, the factor and the things that factor are different in meaning and also different in phrasing. I will give you a simile for this. Since some wise people here understand the meaning of a statement by means of a simile. Suppose, Venerable Sirs, a black ox and a white ox were yoked together by a single harness or yoke. Would one be speaking rightly if one were to say, the black ox is the factor of the white ox, the white ox is the factor of the black ox. No householder, the black ox is not the factor of the white ox, nor is the white ox the factor of the black ox, but rather the single harness or yoke by which the two are yoked together. That is the factor there. And Chitta said, So too, friend, the eye is not the factor of forms, nor are forms the factor of the eye, but rather the desire and lust that arise there independence on both, that is the factor there. The ear is not the factor of sounds, the nose is not the factor of odors, the tongue is not the factor of taste, the body is not the factor of tactile objects, the mind is not the factor of thoughts, nor are thoughts the factor of the mind, but rather the desire and lust that arises there, independence on both, that is the factor there. And they said, it is a gain for you, householder. It is well gained by you, householder, in that you have the eye of wisdom that ranges over the deep word of the Buddha. That's the end of the sutta. You see this uh, chitta, the layman, uh, he's an anagamin, uh, third fruit, arya. And he went to these monks because they didn't seem to really understand uh, the difference between the factor and the things that factor uh, so he explained to them. But you see, when he went to them, he paid respect to them. He doesn't think, oh, I'm Anagamin. These are only Putujana, ordinary monks who don't know anything. Why should I pay respect to them? It's not like that. Because a layman takes refuge with the 
Buddha, the Dhamma and the Bhikkhu Sangha. It's always mentioned in the suttas. Eh? The Sangha is the Bhikkhu Sangha. So when he pays respect, eh? he pays respect to the Sangha. He doesn't think I'm paying respect to this monk. But then towards the end, eh, he said, so too, friend, the eye is not the fetter of forms. So here he says friend, eh? this is a friend because actually the translation from the word abuso. During the Buddha's time, eh, monks address each other as abuso. Abuso can be translated as uh, reverend. Here they translate it as friend. Uh, so probably he used this, the word uh, that is that was used at that time between monks. Uh. This uh, Chitta is a very interesting person. And uh, later you see uh, that uh, sometimes uh, he requests the monks to teach Dhamma. And if they don't know how to teach Dhamma, he will teach them Dhamma. So here the factor and the things that factor, the factor is the is the desire and craving that is the factor, and then the things that factor are the eye, forms, ear, sounds, nose, smells, tongue, taste, body, touch, and the mind and um, thoughts. So those are the things eh, that factor eh, because they are the cause of the factor. But the factor itself is the desire and lust eh, for that. The next sutta is 41.2. On one occasion, a number of elder monks were dwelling at Machi Kasanda in the wild mango grove. And Chitta, the householder, approached those elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side and said to them, Venerable sirs, let the elder monks consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me. The elder monks consented by silence. Then Chitta, the householder, having understood that the elders had consented, rose from his seat, paid homage to them, and departed, keeping them on his right. When the night had passed, in the morning the elder monks dressed, took their bowls and outer robes, and went to the residence of Chitta, the householder, there they sat down on the appointed seats. Then Chitta, the householder, approached the elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side and said to the venerable el chief elder, Venerable elder, elder here refers to Tera, it is said, diversity of elements, diversity of elements. In what way, venerable sir, has the diversity of elements been spoken of by the blessed one? When this was said, the Venerable Chief Elder was silent. A second time and a third time, Chitta, the householder, asked the same question. And a second time and a third time, the Venerable Chief Elder was silent. On that occasion, the Venerable Isidata was the most junior monk in that Sangha. Then the Venerable Isidata said to the Venerable Chief Elder, Allow me, Venerable Elder, to answer Chitta, the householder's question. And he said, answer it, friends, Isidata. So, Venerable Isidata asked Chitta, Now, householder, are you asking thus? Venerable elder, it is said, diversity of elements, diversity of elements. In what way, Venerable Sir, has the diversity of elements been spoken of by the Blessed One? Yes, Venerable Sir. The diversity of elements, householder, has been spoken of by the Blessed One thus. The I element, form element, I consciousness element, That's, uh, and then the ear element, the sound element, and ear consciousness element, the nose element, the smell or odor element, the nose consciousness element, the tongue element, the taste element, the tongue consciousness element, the body element, the touch element, the body consciousness element, the mind element, thought element, the mind consciousness element. It is in this way, householder, that the diversity of elements have been spoken of by the Blessed One. Then Chitta, the householder, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Isidata's words, with his, own, with his own hand served and satisfied the elder monks with the various kinds of, deli of delicious food. When the elder monks had finished eating and had put away their bowls, they rose from their seats and departed. Then the venerable chief elder said to the venerable Isidata, It is good, friend Isidata, 
that the answer to this question occurred to you. The answer did not occur to me. Therefore, friend Isidata, whenever a similar question comes up at some other time, you should clear it up. And that's the end of the sutta. So here you see the, the most senior monk, uh, he was asked this question, he couldn't answer. And the most junior monk had to answer for him. Uh, oh, sometimes it's like that. Uh. So that's why a monk has to be learned in the suttas, in the Vinaya. Sometimes he asks a question and he cannot answer. Uh, it's a bit uh, embarrassing. But it's worse uh, if he gives a wrong answer and gives people the wrong view. 41.3, the next sutta. Then Chitta, the householder, approached the elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side and said to the venerable chief elder, Venerable elder, uh, stop here for a moment. This elder, uh, Tera, means a monk uh, who has uh, uh, been ordained with a higher ordination uh, for 10 years or more. The translation in Chinese is Chang Lao. But nowadays in Chinese Buddhism, because there are so many uh, senior monks, uh, so they reserve it only for a very respected monk, Chang Lao. But uh, in Theravada Buddhism, uh, any monk who has ten vasa is uh, called uh, Thera, an elder. That's according to Vinaya, earliest uh, Buddhism. Venerable elder, there are various views that arise in the world. The world is eternal. The world is not eternal. The world is finite. The world is infinite. The soul and the body are the same. The soul is one thing, the body is another. The Tathagata exists after death. The Tathagata does not exist after death. The Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death. The Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. These as well as the 62 views mentioned in the Brahma Jala Sutta. Now when what exists do these views come to be? When what is non-existent, do these views not come to be? And this was said, the Venerable Chief Elder was silent. A second time and a third time, Chitta, the householder, asked the same question. And a second time and a third time, the Venerable Chief Elder was silent. And on that occasion, the Venerable Isidata was the most junior monk in that Sangha. Then the Venerable Isidata said to the Venerable Chief Elder, Allow me, Venerable Elder, to answer Chitta, the householder's question. Answer it, friend Isidata. Now, householder, are you asking thus? Venerable Elder, there are various views that arise in the world. The world is eternal. The world is not eternal. The world is finite. The world is infinite, etc. These, as well as the 62 speculative views mentioned, the Brahma Jala. Now, when what exists, do these views come to be? When what is non-existent, do these views not come to be? Yes, Venerable Sir. As to the various views that arise in the world, householder, the world is eternal, the world is not eternal, the world is finite, the world is infinite, etc. These as well as the 62 speculative views mentioned in the Brahma Jala Sutta. When there is identity view, these views come to be. When there is no identity view, these views do not come to be. And Chitta asked, But Venerable Sir, how does identity view come to be? And the Venerable Isidata replied, Here, householder, the unlearned ordinary worldling, who does not see the noble ones, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who does not see superior men, and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regard form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in the self, or self as in the form. Similarly, for feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. He regards the aggregates as the self, or the aggregates as belonging to self, or the aggregates as in the self, or the self as in the aggregates. It is in such a way that identity view comes to be. And remember, sir, how does identity view not come to be? And he answered, Here, householder, the learned noble disciple who sees noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in the Dhamma, who sees superior persons and is skilled and disciplined in the Dhamma, does not regard form or body as self 
or self as possessing form, or form as in the self, or self as in the form. Similarly, he does not regard feeling, perception, volition, or consciousness uh, as the self, or as belonging to self, or in the self, or the self as in these aggregates. It is in such a way that identity view does not come to be. Then uh, Chitta asks, Venerable Sir, where does Master Isidata come from? And he said, I come from Avanti, householder. And Chitta said, There is, Venerable Sir, a clansman from Avanti named Isidata, an unseen friend of ours who has gone forth. Has the Venerable One ever met him? And he said, Yes, householder. Where is that Venerable One now dwelling, Venerable Sir? When this was said, the Venerable Isidata was silent. And then Jitta asked, Is the Master Isidata? Yes, householder. And then Jitta said, Then let Master Isidata delight in the delightful wild mango grove at Machi Kasanda. I will be zealous in providing Master Isidata with robes, arms, food, lodgings and medicinal requisites. That is kindly said, householder. Stop here for a moment. So this uh, Rebel Isidata answered this Jitta's questions uh, very well. So after that, he, Jitta asked him, where do you come from, uh, Reverend? And he says, from Avanti. And he says, uh, we also have a relative uh, from Avanti, uh, also called Isidata, uh, who has renounced, uh, although we have never met him. Uh, because uh, in India, uh, in those days, uh, traveling was not easy. Uh, you have to walk from place to place. Uh, so, because Avanti was very far from where this uh, Chitta stays uh, at Machikasanda, so he has never been to see this relative. Uh, but he heard uh, that this relative of his uh, had renounced. Uh, so he asked him, where is that uh, rebel staying now? Uh, so that rebel Isidata was quiet, kept quiet. Uh, so he guess uh, must be him. So when he learned that it was him, his relative, uh, then he asked his venerable Isidata to stay long uh, in his uh, mango grove. Uh, and he said he will provide all the necessary requisites. Uh. Then Chitta, the householder, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Isidata's words, with his own hand served and satisfied the elder monks with the various kinds of delicious food. When the elder monks had finished eating and had put away their bowls, they rose from the seats and departed. Then the Venerable Chief Elder said to the Venerable Isidata, It is good, friend Isidata, that the answer to this question occurred to you. The answer did not occur to me. Therefore, friend Isidata, whenever a similar question comes up at some other time, you should clear it up. Then the Venerable Isidata set his lodging in order, and taking bowl and rope, he left Machikasanda. When he left Machikasanda, he left for good and he never returned. That's the end of the sutta. So here, you see, yeah, people, uh, some people will be surprised. La. How come uh, he stays here and his relative wants to provide him with everything? La. And yet, la, he left. Because uh, he's a real cultivator. La. Because he's a real cultivator, la. he doesn't want people to attach to him. La. He doesn't want to form ties. La. If he stay long, especially his own relative, feels maybe indebted to him. And also other relatives, when they hear, they will come. <laughs> so he wants to be alone. So he went up. See, those monks who understand the Dhamma, and then they renounce to practice. Then they don't want to attach to anything. 41.4 On one occasion, a number of elder monks were dwelling at Machi Kasanda in the wild mango grove. Then Chitta, the householder, approached those elder monks, paid homage to them, sat down to one side, and said, Venerable Sirs, let the elders consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me in my cow shed. The elder monks consented by silence. Then Chitta, the householder, having understood that the elders had consented, rose from his seat, paid homage to them, and departed, keeping them on his right. When the night had passed, in the morning the elder monks dressed, took their bowls and outer robes, and went to the cow shed of Chitta the householder. There they sat down on the appointed seats. Then Chitta the householder, with his own hand, served and satisfied the elder monks with delicious milk rice, 
meat with ghee. Then the elder monks, when the elder monks had finished eating and had put away their bowls, they rose from their seats and departed. Then Chitta, the householder, having said, Give away the remainder, that means to his workers, uh, followed close behind the elder monks. Now on that occasion, the heat was sweltering, very hot, and the elders went along as if the bodies were melting because of the food they had eaten. They were sweating a lot. Now and on that occasion, the Venerable Mahaka was the most junior monk in that Sangha. Then the Venerable Mahaka said to the Venerable Chief Elder, It would be good, Venerable Elder, if a cool wind would blow, and a canopy of clouds would form, and the sky would drizzle. And the, the chief monk said, That would be good, friend. Then the Venerable Mahaka performed such a feat of psychic power that a cool wind blew and a canopy of clouds formed and the sky drizzled. Then it occurred to Chitta, the householder, such is the psychic power and might possessed by the most junior monk in this Sangha. Then when the Venerable Mahaka arrived at the monastery, he said to the Venerable Chief Elder, Is this much enough, Venerable Elder? That's enough, friend Mahaka. What's been done is sufficient, friend Mahaka. What's been offered is sufficient. Then the elder monks went to their dwellings, and the Venerable Mahaka went to his own dwelling. Then Chitta, the householder, approached the Venerable Mahaka, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to him, It would be good, Venerable Sir, if Master Mahaka would show me a superhuman miracle of psychic power. Then, householder, spread your cloak upon the veranda and scatter a bundle of brass upon it. Yes, Venerable Sir, Chitta the householder replied, and he spread his cloak upon the veranda and scattered a bundle of grass upon it. Then when he had entered his dwelling and shut the boat, the Venerable Mahaka performed a feat of psychic power such that a flame shot through the keyhole and the chink of the door and burned the grass but not the cloak. Chitta the householder shook out his cloak and stood to one side, shocked and terrified. Then the Venerable Mahaka came out of his dwelling and said to Chitta, the householder, Is this much enough, householder? That's enough, Venerable Mahaka. What's been done is sufficient, Venerable Mahaka. What's been offered is sufficient. Let Master Mahaka delight in the delightful wild mango grove at Machikasanda. I will be zealous in providing Master Mahaka with ropes, arms, food, lodgings and medicinal requisites. That is kindly said, householder. Then the Venerable Mahaka set his lodging in order, and taking bowl and rope, he left Machikasanda. When he left Machikasanda, he left for good, and he never returned. So this is another great monk uh, with psychic power, uh, and he doesn't like to also attach to anyone. And uh, these good monks, uh, they don't like people to know their psychic power. If, they, if the news goes around, uh, everybody will come on to see his psychic power. <laughs> so he will be very busy, got no time to meditate. Uh, so he prefer to go off. 41.5 On one occasion, the Venerable Kamabu was dwelling at Machikasanda in the wild mango grove. Then Chitta, the householder, approached the Venerable Kamabu, paid homage to him and sat down to one side. The Venerable Kamabu then said to him, This has been said, householder, with faultless wheel and a white awning, the one spoke, chariot rolls, see it coming, trouble free, the stream cut without bondage. How, householder, should the meaning of this brief statement be understood in detail? And Chitta asked, Was this stated by the Blessed One, Venerable Sir? Yes, householder. Then wait a moment, Venerable Sir, while I consider its meaning. Then after a moment's silence, Chitta, the householder, said to the Venerable Kamabu, Faultless, this Venerable Sir is a designation for the virtues, Sila. White awning, this is a designation for liberation. One spoke, this is a designation for Sati, I think it should be Sati, recollection. Rolls, this is a designation for going forward and returning. Chariot, this is a designation for this body consisting of the four great elements originating from mother and father, built up out of rice and gruel, subject to impermanence, to being worn and rubbed away, to breaking apart and dispersal. Last, venerable sir, is trouble. Hatred is trouble. Delusion is trouble. 
For a monk whose asavas are destroyed, these have been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like palm stumps, obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the monk whose asavas are destroyed is called trouble-free. The one who is coming, this is a designation for the arahan. The stream, this venerable sir, is a designation for craving. For a monk whose asavas are destroyed, this has been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the monk whose asavas are destroyed is called one with the stream cut. Last venerable sir is bondage. Hatred is bondage. Delusion is bondage. For a monk whose asavas are destroyed, these have been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like palm stumps, obliterated, so that they are no more subject to future arising. Therefore, the monk whose asavas are destroyed is called one, one no more in bondage. Thus, Venerable Sir, when it was said by the Blessed One, with faultless wheel and a white awning, the one spoke chariot rolls, see it coming, trouble free, the stream cut without bondage. It is in such a way that I understand in detail the meaning of what was stated by the Blessed One in brief. It is a gain for you, householder. It is well gained by you, householder, in that you have the eye of wisdom that ranges over the deep word of the Buddha. It's the end of the sutta. So here, the Venerable Kamabu uh, quoted saying uh, of the Buddha to this uh, Chitta and asked him to explain. And after thinking a while about it, uh, he could explain so well. So... It shows also uh, that uh, his knowledge of the Dhamma is very deep. Uh, that's why compared to nowadays, uh, people ask, why nowadays it's so hard to attain Sotopanna? This is not hard. The only thing, you don't make the effort. In the Buddha's time, uh, they memorize those suttas. Uh, every day they memorize every day. And it's in their local language. So when they memorize the suttas uh, in their local language, uh, then it sticks in their mind. Uh. If we were to study the Nikayas, uh, Year in, year out, you finish it, you read it again, finish it, you read it again. It will have the same effect. Or you listen to the talks on based on the Nikayas. Listen again and again and again, and again until it sticks in your mind. Then it will be very clear to you. Then you will be just like the people during the Buddha's time.